A great controversy rages between good and evil, and humanity is caught in the crossfire. Satan has crafted his most cunning end-time deceptions, but his plans are doomed to fail. Get ready to anchor your minds in truth as the Bible exposes his lies and prepares us for our soon coming Savior. And now, live from the Campus Hill Church of Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California, we bring you this presentation of The Great Controversy, End Time Deceptions. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Campus Hills Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're holding our winter camp meeting in sunny California. What better place to be in February when it's 9 or 10 or 15 degrees at home to come to California? What a privilege to come together and study the Word of God. We welcome you at home to a special edition of 3ABN Sabbath School panel live here from the Campus Hill Church. I'm Jill Morricone, and we're so glad that you've joined us, and we're so glad each one of our 3ABN family and Campus Hill family is here to join us as well. We're on lesson number seven, Daniel chapter six, Daniel and the lion's den, from the lion's den to the angel's den. I want to introduce our panel at this time. To my left, Pastor Kenny Shelton. Privileged to have you here. It's always a blessing. Love to study the Word of God with this panel and study it with you. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Thank you so much. To your left, Pastor John Lomacain. Thank you, Pastor John, for we your study the of the Word. We know the Lord has a message for each one of us today. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. To his left, Pastor Ryan Day. Thank you, Ryan, for being here. Amen. It's always a blessing to be here, especially in Loma Linda. Praise the Lord. Amen. And last but not least, Pastor John Denzi, always appreciate your insight into the Word of God. It's surely a blessing to be here, and we encourage you to pray for us as well. Amen. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor John, would you pray for us? Our loving Father in heaven, as we bow our hearts in your presence on this, your blessed Sabbath day, we invite your Holy Spirit to come, Lord, and to be the power that attends and governs and guide our hearts and minds. We pray for the ears of those, as the Spirit has said, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Amen. May our discussions and may our guidance today bring glory and honor to you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Open up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. That is our study for today. If you think about the correlation between Daniel 3 and Daniel 6, we're going to start there and then we'll jump into our study of Daniel chapter 6. You know, there's a chiastic structure to the book of Daniel. Daniel 2 through Daniel 7 is the Aramaic portion of the book of Daniel. It begins in Hebrew, it switches to Aramaic, it continues in Aramaic to chapter 7, and then it switches back to Hebrew. And if you think about that structure, Daniel chapter 2 is about what? Nebuchadnezzar's dream of four kingdoms. Daniel 7 is about Daniel's vision of the four kingdoms. One was the image, one was the beast. Daniel chapter 3, Daniel's friends are delivered from the fiery furnace. Daniel chapter 6, Daniel himself is delivered from the lion's den. Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar is humbled by the divine sentence. Daniel 5, Belshazzar is humbled by the divine sentence. We see this correlation between Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. In Daniel chapter 3, Daniel's three friends are tested. Well, they remain loyal to God amidst persecution from a pagan, from a Gentile king. Will they remain loyal or will they bow down and worship the golden image? In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel himself is tested. Will he remain loyal to God amidst persecution from a Gentile pagan court? In Daniel 3, we see Daniel's three friends, they remain faithful to God. In Daniel 6, we see that Daniel himself remains faithful to God. In Daniel 3, the king is exposed as arrogant and jealous. In Daniel 6, the king's counselors are exposed as arrogant and jealous. In Daniel 3, God shows up, doesn't he, Pastor Kenny? Yeah. And he delivers his people. Yeah. In Daniel 6, God shows up. And he delivers his servant from the lion's den. 
Let's take a look at our memory text. That is found, and we're going to read it together. It will be on the screen for you in Daniel chapter 6, verse 4. Daniel 6, verse 4. Let's read it together. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error found in him. Now on Sunday we look at jealous souls. We're going to be reading, my portion is five verses, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. So we're looking at Daniel 6, 1 through 5. Remember, Daniel was first captured as a young man and taken as a, as a slave to Babylon. He was what, 16 years, 17 years, 18 years old, a teenager when he was captured. That would have been 605 B.C., now, the previous chapter to Daniel 6, Daniel chapter 5, Babylon's overthrown. That is in 539 B.C. So we're looking at 66 years, 66, 65 years have passed since Daniel was first captured to now the Medo-Persians have taken over the empire. So we could say Daniel's an old man. Would you say that? Or some of you who are older, you might want to say Daniel is an older man. Pastor Kenny said, thank you. <laughs> so Daniel would have been maybe 80 years old, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, but he would have been an older man at this point. So let's pick up just before Daniel 6. We're going to read Daniel 5, verses 30 and 31. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Now remember, there's no chapters in the original language. That was added later. So we pick up verse 1, chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. Now this change from the Babylonian Empire to the Medo-Persian Empire came about just as God had predicted. We saw that in Daniel chapter 2. The vision, remember the head of gold, represented what? Babylon. And then the chest and arms of silver represented Medo-Persia. And now that was years before God gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream. And then years later, we see this prophecy being fulfilled when the Babylonian Empire ended that night, and then the Medo-Persian Empire began. Now, you know I like lists. So we're going to start. We're looking at the lessons we gained from the passage. Then we're going to look at some of the dangers of jealousy. And finally, some keys to overcome jealousy. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the lessons we can learn from this passage. The first lesson I see, lesson number one, organization matters. Lesson number one, organization matters. Daniel 6, 1 and 2. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Now you might think, we at work can be haphazard. It doesn't really matter what we do. But organization matters. Organization is necessary to any government or to the work of God. Lesson number two, your character, your heart matters the most. Daniel 6, verse 3. Next verse. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave him thought to setting him over the whole realm. Now the Bible could have said, Daniel distinguished himself above everybody else. And why was that the case? The Bible could have said it's because he was really organized. Or because he paid attention to detail. Or because he was very intelligent. Or because of his ability. And that's why Daniel was distinguished. And I think clearly he had all of those qualities. Would we agree? Yeah. Daniel had those qualities. Yet at the same time, the Bible doesn't mention any of those. It says Daniel was distinguished above everyone else. Why? Because an excellent yeah. spirit was found in him. You see, your character, who you are inside, 
matters the most. Right. Organization matters. Your character matters. Amen. Number three, where God places you matters. Amen. Verse 4, Daniel 6, 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was, what's that word? Faithful. Faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. You see, God had placed Daniel in Babylon. God had elevated Daniel to the position he had placed him in in Babylon. God elevated Daniel to the position he had him in in the Medo-Persian Empire. God is the one who had a reason for him. He wasn't there. Daniel wasn't there for his own glory. It was because God had a purpose in his life. Organization matters. Your character matters. Where God places you matters. Number four, integrity matters. Daniel 6, let's read verse 4 again, and then we're going to pick up 5. Verses 4 and 5. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So there's two words I want you to pick up in that passage. He, it says, they found no fault. What? There was no error. Did you see that word? And there was no fault found in him. Now let's take a look at those two words. Those two words, error and fault. The word error means neglect or remissness. That's not a word we use today. Remissness. That means to overlook or forget something. So in other words, they could find nothing in Daniel's work life. He never forgot anything. Could any of you say that? I forget every day. He never overlooked a detail. He never forgot anything. He kept track of everything that needed to happen within the organization of the government. That's error. And then the next word was fault. Now that word means corruption. So not only did Daniel not overlook anything, there was no corruption in him. There was no sin in him. So organization matters. Your character matters. Where God places you matters. And integrity matters. Now let's talk about this jealousy of those princes. Jealousy is often rooted in fear. You know that? To be jealous is to be anxiously suspicious or vigilant of someone else. There's a fear of somehow being displaced by a rival in their affection or in their favor. Jealousy is often hidden. The Word of God says the heart is deceitful. Above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Oftentimes, we don't even see or know or recognize the jealousy in our own hearts. Jealousy often leads to bad decisions, to wrongful oppression of other people, and it can hinder the spread of the gospel. Turn with me to Acts. Acts chapter 5 verses 17 and 18. Now this is the early Christian church and the gospel is going like crazy and I would imagine that Peter and John and the other apostles were fairly well liked and popular by certain of the people and the Sanhedrin and the scribes and Pharisees did not like that so well. Acts 5, 17 and 18. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him and they were filled with indignation. In the Greek, the word is jealousy. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. So because of their jealousy of Peter and John and the apostles, they tried to put a stop to the, th th uh, the spread of the gospel. So let's look in closing at three keys to overcome jealousy. Three keys to overcome jealousy. Ask, adjust, and adopt. Ask God to show you when jealousy rears its ugly head. 
We already quoted this, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Just ask God to show you your heart. Yeah. Ask God to show you where jealousy exists in your heart that you don't even know and you don't recognize. Number one is ask. Number two, adjust. Adjust your thought life. Jealousy begins in the mind. We are called to take every thought captive to the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Instead of doing that, what do we do? We feed our jealousy. We tend to it as a well-watered plant. We give it life and root and cause it to spring forth. Don't engage in negativity. Don't engage in self-pity or let your imagination go. Take those thoughts of jealousy captive. Surrender them to the Lord Jesus. And number three, adopt a grateful heart. I believe a thankful heart is the greatest antidote for jealousy. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Philippians 4.11 says, I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. So whether you have a lot or a little, money, fame, position, family, be content. Be grateful in what God has given you. Ask God to show you when jealousy rears its head. Adjust your thought life and adopt a grateful heart. Pastor Kenny. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a, what a foundation is set. Thank you so much. I have Monday's lesson, and it talks about the plot against Daniel. Mm. Now, any of you have ever been in a plot? So we can kind of maybe relate to things. Sometimes people are plotters. And so we need to look at this and maybe relate to our own life. I believe in studying in, in the book of Daniel. I think pastors here will all agree with me, each one here on the panel, that we look for the, that what relates to us today. We, the blessings are here, certainly in the days of Daniel. But if we cannot connect with those things and bring them into the day that we are living in, we're missing a great blessing. After all, is not the book of Daniel was sealed, was it not until what? The time of the end, and we realize it's open, and so these things apply to us today that will help us. Plot against Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 6 through 9 as the foundation. Daniel chapter 6, 6 through 9. It said, Then these presidents and princesses assembled together to the king, and said it thus unto them, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains, they have counseled together to establish a royal statue and to make a firm decree, and whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man, notice this, for 30 days, save they, O king, he shall be cast, where? Into the den of lions. Verse 8, now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not charged according to, or changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. So here we have, and Sunday's lesson brought out rather clearly, this plot is, was to remove Daniel. The only way that Daniel was going to be able to be removed would be against something they could find, the law of his God, the law of God. Again, that pertains to us who are living today. There are things happening in the world today we need to be very well aware of that's going on. There are plots that are going on, believe it or not. And there's things that are happening behind the scenes that we need to be aware of. Now, notice this, it had to center around the law of God. And then keep in mind that history does what? Repeats Somebody help me. History does what? History repeats itself. So what we are going through and we're studying here pertains to the hour in which we are living in and in the future days by God's grace. So we need to look at that very, very closely here today. Now, could, could, you find, could they find anything against Daniel? No. no. Why? Because the Bible said he had an excellent spirit within him. And I think we agreed that none of us in here raised our hand when we said we have an excellent spirit. They couldn't find anything against us. And that would be so nice. You know what? God's looking for people like that today. He's looking for people who will come to him and they confess their sins and he covers us with his righteousness, and those are the ones he's coming back after. I think Daniel sets a good, wonderful example for us. Now, remember, as we're looking here at the, about the laws, the, the laws of the land eventually will come against the laws of God. 
we're going to have to make a decision of who we're going to serve. And this is what Daniel is bringing out. There was a choice, a decision for him. We know, as we read the great controversy and the, certainly the Bible, Revelation 13 and so on, that the great test, the Sabbath, will be the great test and the issue in the end days, great controversy 605. So we need not mince around about it or skirt the issue or act like it's not going to happen because I believe that God has pinned it, and he has so pinned it that it's going to take place, and you and I need to, by the grace of God, get our heads wrapped around it and know that it's going to take place. A law is going to eventually be invoked against commandment keepers. What are we doing? Oh, we're talking about Daniel, absolutely, because there was laws that was getting ready to be invoked against him. And notice how it was going to be. There's going to have to be a little church and a little state, as it were, coming together. And we realize that's going to happen here in the last days. Finally, we realize that the, uh, the end result was the death decree. So can we look at that in studying the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, that a death decree was out before him. A death decree will be out before the people of God. Oh, it might shock some of you and surprise some of you, but maybe it's time that you got shocked. Maybe it's time that you got a little bit of surprise, you know, if you haven't heard it before. If not, settle into this issue that what we are heading for. Regardless of what men may say, God's Word has already said this is going to take place. Now, notice the laws will be what, against those who keep all the commandments of God. And they're going to be denounced as, you know, oh, they're deserving of the severest punishment. The Bible said definitely, definitely that's going to be the death decree. Isn't that what we read? Revelation chapter 13. A death decree goes out. Here we're finding here anyone that goes against the king, there would be what? Would there be debt cast into the line? To me, that'd be a death decree. We can relate to that, and we should relate to that now. Now, King Darius is soon to fall into a trap that it is laid. If any of you have ever been in a situation where a trap was laid for you, maybe you'll understand this a little bit better than maybe some who haven't. But notice, this trap was prepared by his officers, those in his court. And sometimes, you know, some of the biggest problems we might have is with uh -oh, our own family and our own friends and those that are closest to us. The Bible says, you know, the last day we need to be aware of these things. Now, why? They want to simply get rid of Daniel. There's no doubt. It. There's a trap is, is laid. But, you know, I want to relate that. If you just allow me to do that today, I want to relate that to the great controversy. I, I brought it up here. You know, we're studying the, uh, thank you, the great controversy. And there's several things in here that I just want you, as we're reading, we're studying Daniel. I understand that. But also, Daniel, there are lessons for us as the last day people that we need to be much aware of. We realize what is happening in the world and the things that are going to take place. I'm going to read from Great Controversy, page 589. And uh, I notice when I read this first few lines, it's referring to a time when the enemy, the devil, is going to come to this earth. Are we, are we there, church? A time when the enemy is going to come here, 2 Corinthians 11, 14. The devil appears as an angel of light. But then it goes on and it relates to our day that we are living in. And just see if it does right now. This may encourage you. When I study the book of Daniel, I get encouraged. When I study the book of Revelation, I get encouraged about the coming of Jesus. And I want you to be encouraged about that because these things are happening now. Don't say later on. Well, it may be in more intensity, but right now these things are happening for God's people who are having their eyes upon Him. Notice, it says right here, it talks about, that while appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all of their maladies, he will bring, the devil will bring disease and disaster. We realize that as he appears here. Well, that the world is going to be in such a situation. Right? The enemy is going to be doing some healing. He's going to be doing some reaching out. And again, it's going to fool people if you don't realize what's going on here. But notice what it says. Until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Notice at that time. Now, right now. Even now, he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land. Notice this, and it's called great fires that are going on. No one knows it better than California, isn't that right? The fires that's going on here, you know you've been through it, you're going through it. California fires and Australia fires and Greece, all around the world. You can look at any time, you know, and you look at, I think it's NASA that takes pictures from above, and they'll say any given time, especially in the month of, of, of August, there are at least 10,000 fires that's going on around the globe. Things are happening. We're being challenged. Millions of acres are being burnt. 
It says here, tornadoes and terrific hailstorms and tempests and floods and cyclones and tidal waves and earthquakes in every place. And in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. may be heavy duty, but you know what? If we haven't got heavy duty, maybe we need to get heavy duty. That's what studying the book of Daniel will do. It'll get us into heavy duty things. Now, notice something else here. This is on page 591. So it will be now while Satan seeks to destroy those who honor God's law. We're getting back, right, relating to Daniel, God's law. He will cause them to be accused of law breakers as men who are dishonoring God and, <clears throat> excuse me, bringing judgments upon the world. Interesting. To accomplish this, he works through both religious and secular authorities. Now, is that not what was happening here? The king and his court, as it were. Things were going on. Notice them. To an enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order. As breaking down, notice the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy. Notice corruption, calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. <clears throat> Excuse me, heavy words. <clears throat> heavy words, but they still, we still need to go over them if we believe that God has inspired them, if the Word of God says these things are going to happen. These relate. They were turning against Daniel because he honored the God of heaven. He kept God's laws, and therefore the finger was pointed, we need to get rid of this person. Daniel had survived, we know, the golden age of Babylon. <clears throat> the king checked his records before he put him into position. You talked about that. And as he checked the records, he found that Daniel was a man of integrity, a man that would, when he said something, it was done. He would keep his word. He was the man for the job. And the officers certainly knew this, and so they were very careful to plot against the king. I call it the king and his court. The king and his court. The king and his court always had eyes that were open. Searching and looking for anything that might uprise, something they didn't want to take place. To try to, I'll use the word here, it don't scare a lot of people, but they tried to detect any kind of conspiracy that was going on in the court. Now, they always did this, and many times we have our eyes and ears open too to make sure that something's not developing, you know, maybe it shouldn't develop. Only the few of the leaders came to the king. But they, well, they told a little lie, I guess, because they said all of us in agreement. So if, you, if all the leaders, you know, they just set up a new kingdom. And so if all the leaders came together and they made this statement, the king had all ears. And so he wanted, to, he wanted to hear what they had to say. They say, we're representing all of the others here. So the king listened and noticed they wanted this petition and again, the death decree. That's what it's going to be. He didn't realize that. I'm sure he didn't realize that. Read something from Great Controversy, page 587. It is one of Satan's devices to combine with falsehood, just enough truth to give it plausibility. They were giving some truth, but also they're giving some falseness. Notice, many advocate forms, note reforms, which the people need. Principles which are in harmony with the Bible. But yet, while there is with these requirements, which is contrary to God's law. Notice, his servants cannot unite with them. Nothing can justify them in setting aside the commandments of God for the precepts of men. Now remember, that may be heavy duty. We realize when you study Daniel and Revelation, which are the two books we need to be studying in this hour that we're living in, it's going to be heavy duty. It's going to be things that you don't want to hear. It's one of the things that you may not want to believe, but they're going to take place because the Word of God says they're going to take place, and we need to be preparing not to go against anything or any man, right, but stay on God's side. That's what he wants us to do. The kingdom wanted no rebellion, and so they didn't want anything bad to happen, but they were setting up. The king just simply said, you know, when they presented this to the king, the king got the big head. So be careful about big heads. Okay, be careful about that because why? Because we're making this law that he was like the, going to be like the, the, the pagan gods. Because they, when the, the pagan people began to pray, what did they do? They had to pay, pray through the king as a mediator. And so that kind of like, well, they can't even do any prayers without unless they pray through me. So anyway, as we continue on with our lesson, you know, keep an eye on Daniel. He's going to stand fast for Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Kenny. Now we go to Daniel's prayer. I want to point your attention to Tuesday's lesson. 
It begins with a Bible verse in Matthew chapter 6. And Daniel has to decide what he's going to do now in the circumstances that he's presented with. Now, the passage I'm going to read in Matthew 6 uh, somewhat describes what Daniel didn't do. Let's look at Matthew 6 and verse 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Well, Daniel knew that there's a time for everything. There's a time to keep silent, and there's a time to speak. There's a time to be hidden, and there's a time to be seen. And Daniel was not about to hide when the Lord wanted him to be seen. We have to decide when the moments come our way which category we're going to be in. And Daniel now, knowing that the writing was signed, this is legislative. What is being said is there's a time coming that legislative decisions are going to be made to prevent the people of God from exercising their religious freedoms. And prayer is something that's very much a freedom that God has given to us. It's not something to be legislated, nor something to be taken away by legislation. I've said to somebody, I remember years ago when prayer was taken out of schools, I said, if you want children to keep praying in schools, just give them a test. <laughs> you don't have to tell me to pray. It's not something that has to be legislated. I can bow my head and silently pray to my God, and when you legislate it, you've got to ask yourself the question, is it prayer for everyone or just prayer for a certain sect of individuals? That's why... Anytime anything is legislated for or against an act that's a Christian's right, it's not something that God ordains. Daniel knew that the writing was signed. So the legislation was made, and he went home, and the Bible says in Daniel 6.10, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he always prayed toward Jerusalem. It was a practice from the early days of his life. He knelt down on his knees three times a day. How many times a day? When I was studying on the occult world, I discovered that in the occult world, they pray five times a day. And I think to myself, if those of us who pray just one time a day, the occult world has an upper hand on us, we have to have practices in our lives that will establish principles that will carry us through the times that are not in our favor. So what I brought out of this was the following examples. And Jill, I don't want to call it a list, but I can't find any other, any other description. One, we cannot choose the circumstances we face, but we can choose our response to those circumstances. The Bible says, now what Daniel did in Daniel 6 is what he did in Daniel 1. He purposed in his heart. What did he do, friends? He purposed in his heart. What Daniel did was already in his heart. It was not something that had to be added to his heart. It was something he purposed from the day that he entered into the province of Babylon. We've got to decide when we are in a foreign land whether or not we're going to carry our religion with us. Now, the foreign land to some of, you, some of us may be our workplace. Some people go to work and they stop being Christians. Some people go to restaurants and are afraid to pray because somebody may watch. My wife and I pray when the plane takes off. We pray when there's turbulence. We pray when it's landing. And we thank God when we get off that it landed safely. You got to pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. One, Daniel purposed in his heart. You see, when God is in your heart, there's no room for anyone else. The Lord was already in Daniel's heart. So when the moment came, he didn't decide at that critical moment whether or not to insert God into his religion. God was always a part of his heart. God was, as a matter of fact, Matthew 22, 37 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I believe that Daniel was considered when that passage was being formulated. Seven very quick points, Jill. <laughs> One, there is no such thing as an invisible witness. Faith is intended to be displayed. Matthew 5, verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. 
nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine, where? Before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There is no such thing as an invisible witness. Faith is intended to be displayed. Secondly, there is no such thing as a silent witness. Either your witness will destroy your silence, or your silence will destroy your witness. Psalms 107 verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If God has redeemed you, there are moments that you need to testify about God's redemption. I like to be around people that think they know a lot because when they think they know a lot, I like to go to the place that I'm strong. I like to go to God's Word. I've discovered that the greatest of men often are revealed for who they really are when we talk to the highest in the universe. As somebody once said, as I sat on the couch of a prime minister, I won't mention the country, and when he came and he sat there and he said to me, why are you not afraid right now? As his guards stood to the right and left, I said, in all due respect, prime minister, I answer to an even higher authority. And he didn't smile for about a minute. He wanted me to sweat. And he said, I like that. <laughs> and then he talked about watching on 3ABN. The redeemed of the Lord ought to say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Daniel was about to redeem. Third point, what we practice in times of peace, we will preserve us in times of tests. What we practice in times of peace will preserve us in times of tests. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. When we practice it, our brain understands that it is the patterns of our lives, and it happens even when circumstances are in a, an adverse setting. Practice makes permanence. Fourthly, and I like this, Daniel did not pray to inform God. Daniel prayed to inform his enemies. Now think about that. He could have prayed to God. He could have closed the doors and said, when this wrath is passed, I'll go ahead and open my windows. But Daniel knew that his enemies were watching. Sometimes you got to inform folk that you have a greater connection than they have. Did you hear what I said? The, the satraps and all the governors had a king that they were connected to. Daniel had the king that he was connected to. Sometimes you got to pray to inform your enemies. Daniel was not giving God any information. He was giving information to those who were watching him. He was saying, I'm going to open my window. I'm going to pray, and I hope you're watching. And I could see they had their 200, 200 millimeter zoom lenses, videotape in it, streaming it on the Internet, making sure the king, are you watching this on Facebook? Daniel's praying. He said, I hope you know I'm praying. When we are allegiant to God, our allegiance does not shrink in times of test. Daniel made it clear that nothing can separate him from God. And Paul says, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, somebody, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, there in the province of Babylon, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul asks, who shall separate us? That's the question you have to ask yourself because the test for Daniel is soon going to be the test for us. Number five, Daniel prayed to make it clear that his allegiance was to an even higher authority. You know, when the apostles were brought to the test, Acts chapter 5 and verse 29 says it this way. When they, were, when they were scrutinized by the powers that be, not only by the local powers or the governmental powers, but they were also scrutinized by ecclesiastical powers. And I love the response. They said, we ought to obey God rather than man. You've got to decide who is more important to you. When this little tiny dot called earth, when this little grain of sand called our world is no longer significant, we have access to worlds unknown. Come on, somebody, say amen. amen. I want to make sure that when the Lord comes that my name is on His list. Amen. I don't care if my name is on anybody else's list. I want to make sure that my name is on God's list. And only allegiance in times 
when circumstances are adverse, will it be clear who is more important in your life? Number six, Daniel's allegiance to God secured God's promises to Daniel. Think about that. Daniel's allegiance to God secured God's promises to Daniel. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, now this is important, and whatever we ask, the Bible says we receive, here's the clause, because we keep His commandments. And this is the part I like, Daniel knew this. And do those things that are pleasing in His sight. You see, when the chips are down, what we do in God's sight is more important than what we do in man's sight. And they thought that they had an upper hand on God, and they thought they had an upper hand on Daniel. But Daniel's allegiance to God was not for sale, and he made sure that what he did in the sight of God was more pleasing than what he did in the sight of all the officials of the province of Babylon. And number seven, God will allow trials to come that the nature of our faith will be revealed. You never know who you are until trials come. But you've got to practice who you're going to be before trials come. Because trials don't develop faith. Trials reveal our faith. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Before prayer means something to God, prayer has to mean something to us. Prayer is not a checklist to tell God what you need. Prayer is an act of worship to let God know that you are never severed from Him. My wife and I pray all the time. We were standing in, in a Best Buy once, and they were trying to convince us to buy a television because it was on sale. And it was, as the salespeople say, last day. And they're trained to convince you. So I said to them, I hit them with something that they were not trained to respond to. I said, before my wife and I buy anything, we have to pray about it. They didn't get that kind of training. So they had no, no comeback. And so I said, if God intends for us to have it, it'll be here when we come back. Lastly, you'll never get a $1,000 answer to a 10-cent prayer. Until you are willing to risk your all, you will never see God's all. And finally, we will never stand tall in the presence of man until we are willing to bow low in the presence of God. You got to determine like Daniel beforehand, purpose it in your heart so that when the time comes, your practices from the day to day in your life will sustain you in the moment when the trial is greatest, and your allegiance will be unquestionable. Amen. Mm. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love Sabbath school panel. Um, as you can see, I, I'm probably, well, I am the youngest one on up there, but I love all of the wisdom Thank I, you. I get to glean from all of the wisdom on this panel week after week. And so uh, iron sharpens iron, praise the Lord. Uh, it's a blessing to be a part of this panel. I get, to, I get to drink from a fire hydrant every time before it gets to me. Praise the Lord. Man, Daniel in the lion's den. How many, how many, uh, how many was, was Daniel in the lion's den your favorite story growing up as a kid? That was me. I was fascinated with lions, and uh, my parents would take me to the zoo and uh, take me and my brother and sister to the zoo, and I didn't care about any of the other animals in the zoo, and as soon as we came to the part where the lion was, I was that one little kid glued to the, to the window looking into the lions, you know, just like, you know, and my mom and dad had to drag me away from the, the looking glass because they said, son, there's more animals. Let's go look at the, let's go look at the hippos. Let's go look. I'd go to each and every animal in the zoo. You know, there's the ducks. You know, there's the, the hippo. There's the whatever. I want to go back and see the lions, right? I was, I was so fascinated with lions. And, the, and, and this has always been an inspiring story to me. Uh, and we're going to see why, as we have seen so far, but especially through this particular trial that Daniel had to go through in Daniel chapter 6, being in this lion lion's den, you and I can't even begin to fathom uh, going through such a trial. And many people don't realize back in these ancient times, you know, these, these particular civilizations and empires, they would have these, you know, these lion's dens and they would starve these lions for weeks, you know, days until they were just frail and then they would 
you know, they would punish people by throwing them into the lion's den. And of course, it was a treacherous end. But we're going to jump right into this. Daniel chapter 6. And I have probably the biggest portion of text uh, to go through in this very short period of time. We're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 6, verses 11 through 23. And notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 11. It says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who who petitions any god or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there's a, there is a political conspiracy going on here. And I like how it says here, interesting, that they were assembled. These brothers were assembled because they were planning. They have, you know, I could imagine if there were cell phones back in this day, they probably would have called each other up. Hey, Bob, hey, Jim, hey, this was me. We got to do something about this Daniel, right? And we're going to see that's exactly how they address him in just a little bit. That Daniel, this Daniel, we got to get him out of here, right? So notice also this plan was to ultimately deceive and to manipulate the higher authority. They knew they could not do anything to Daniel in and of himself because he had great favor with the king. He had won the king's heart. And so they decided, you know what, let's try to manipulate the higher authority. And we see that a lot of that stuff goes on even in today's time. Notice as the Bible continues on. The king answered and said, the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Verse 13 So they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, there it is, that Daniel who is one of the captives of Judah does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. So they know at this point that Daniel is praying three times a day because they've had this brother on lockdown surveillance. Just as Pastor said, you could imagine, you know, as they're conspiring against one another, yeah, you get the binoculars, I'll get the camera, you get the notepad. We're going to make sure we record this thing so that we can go back and manipulate the king into taking this brother out, right? So they've got this brother on lockdown surveillance. They've watched every, uh, they, they have watched very particularly so that they might catch the slightest mistake that they can go report to the king. And it's interesting that they would say that Daniel. Like, these, you could tell these are some cunning brothers. These are some crafty brothers because they're going to show up at the king real suave and smooth like they don't know, like they don't know who Daniel is. You know, oh, hey, king, um, what's, what's, that one, what's that one guy's name? What's his name? What's his, oh, yeah, that Daniel. You know that one guy, Daniel? Yeah, we saw him doing this, right? They're cunningly devising something against Daniel here, and they're trying to suck the king into their political circus. And we'll continue on in verse 14. Notice what the Bible continues to say. And the king, when he heard these words, notice, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored to the going down of the sun to deliver him. Now, this is interesting that it says he was greatly displeased with himself. Now, you got to just know that he was, he was upset and angry at these guys. He's, he's, he's picked up by now what's going on in this particular situation. But notice how the Bible records that he was displeased with himself. He realized that, that he, they got one over on him, and now he's starting to realize. See, the king, the king knew immediately what had just taken place. He knew he had been scammed into a conspiracy against Daniel. And as I said earlier, Daniel had won over the king's heart. He had come close to the king. And, and the king, by this point, he's feeling ashamed. Why? Because he knew the character of Daniel. He knew that Daniel was a righteous man and had no ill intention to usurp him in any way. The king tried to think of any loophole possible to get around executing Daniel. But, of course, this political movement is going to be much more powerful at this point. It's irreversible. He's past the point of no return. Notice verse 16 here. It says, So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the lion's den. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve, how often? Continually. Continually. He will deliver you. Now, this is fascinating because this particular king, this is a pagan king. This is not a Christian king. And he's making a statement of faith. Notice that here. He's making, knowing that Daniel was a righteous man and hearing the stories perhaps of how God had delivered Daniel and his friends before, he's declaring in faith the fact that Daniel's God would save him. And I love the fact that he brings out, he says, Oh, Daniel, notice, your God whom you serve... What does that teach us? Yeah. 
You know, we can learn something from Daniel. Do we serve our God continually, my friends? You know, and he had faith upon the fact that even though he might not have personally known this God, he seen Daniel's character. He viewed Daniel each and every day. He was in Daniel's presence. He knew that this man was special. And he said, the God that you serve continually, surely he will come through for you in this moment. And verse 17, then a stone was brought and laid up in the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Mm. Now the king went into his palace and spent the night fasting. Awesome. That is fascinating. He went, spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. He said, cut the music. This ain't a time to dance and sing and celebrate. Right. Also, his sleep went from him. This is very, very unusual behavior for a pagan king, a king of any sort, really. Why was he fasting? That's interesting, right? Why was he fasting? Well, I, perhaps maybe he was just so sick to death of what the, of the whole situation that he just couldn't eat. But the fact that he's fasting, that's, that's a purposeful thing. He, perhaps maybe he was learning from Daniel. Maybe he had seen Daniel. The Bible records that Daniel often fasted and prayed. So he's, he's noticing, you can notice here that he's stressing over his friend Daniel because he knows the situation at hand. Notice verse 19 and onward. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of the lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve, there it is again, continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Notice how after the lion's den, he's now taken up for himself. That's powerful, right? You know, he could have said, wait, 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 there's no record before this. Hey, king, whoa, wait, you can't throw me in this lion's den. I haven't done anything wrong. He waits till after the lion's den to say, hey, look, by the way, I didn't really do anything wrong, right? This is powerful. You see, God honors truth, my friends. Yes. You know, I just have to say, I can't, I cannot, I, I despise politics. It's, it's, a, it's just one of those things I, I, I'll try not to say too much. Um, but, you know, what, what spirit is behind this whole movement? This is not the spirit of God, right? And we know that this is the spirit of the enemy because when you go all the way over to Revelation chapter 12, it says there, there's a particular verse there that says, and, and, uh, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought the dragon and his angels. Yes. And that word war there, I always, you know, I always, when I read that text, I would always picture this, you know, this, this, you know, this weird, like I used to watch movies back in the day. I don't know how many of you have seen Star Wars. Don't raise your hand. I always pictured that like a, like a major Star Wars scene, you know, like the devil shows up and he pulls out, you know, his sword or his lightsaber and he challenges Jesus to a duel. You know, you know, there's a new sheriff in town and Jesus is like, no, you know, but think about this, the very nature of this war in heaven, you know, would the devil really have the guts to show up and challenge the king of the universe to a sword fight yeah. or to a boxing match? When you look in the original Greek here, the word war is the word polemos. It's in the Greek, polemos, which is where we get such English words as politics. The very nature of this, of this, convert, this, this whole war in heaven was political. The devil was going around and he's scheming and lying and he's spreading all these lies to try to win, as the Bible says, one-third of the angels of heaven. We see that same spirit at work right here. But let, let, let me just make it clear. God honors truth. He is a God of truth. He honors honesty. Yeah. And while he did not deliver Daniel from the lion's den, he indeed saved him through the lion's den. Yeah. There's a little something we can learn from that. Amen? Yeah. I love this particular quote from Prophets and Kings, page 543 and 544. It says, God did not prevent Daniel's enemies from casting him into the lion's den. He permitted evil angels and wicked men thus far to accomplish their purpose. But it was that he might make the deliverance of his servant more marked, mm -hmm. and the defeat of the enemies of truth and righteousness more complete. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, according to Psalm 76. The psalmist has testified, through the courage of this one man, 
who chose to follow right rather than policy. Notice that. Chose to follow right, what's right, more than policy. Satan was to be defeated and the name of God was to be exalted and honored. Amen? That's powerful. Praise the Lord. And I love verse 23 here. It says, Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the lion's den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No injury whatsoever was found in him because he believed in his God. My friends, do you believe in your God today? We are living in the last days. The Bible has told us time and time again there's a time of trouble coming. This this story right here is just a precursor. It's kind of a foreshadowing of what you and I are going to go through in this near future. I love How many of you enjoyed that powerful sermon that Ivor Myers gave last night? Man, and we learned that there's going to be a death decree in the future. But guess what? When there's a death decree and you serve the living God and you believe in him and you put your trust in him, Psalm 91, verses 9 through 11, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels, just like Daniel, charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Amen. Amen. Seems like every person could continue longer than the time allotted, but we have a limited time. My portion is Thursday's lesson, Vindication. And as I was considering the scriptures, you know, a a certain passage came to mind, and I want to praise the Lord that it was found. Uh, I like to turn to Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26, because there is something going on here. You see, the devil is working in the minds of people uh, to cause damage to God's people. And uh, he uses jealousy. He uses ambition. He uses different things to try to hurt God's people. And in Proverbs chapter 26, beginning in verse 24, I like to read the following. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him. For there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. Now, the wonderful thing is that verse 27 tells us, whoever digs a pit to cause God's people damage will fall into it. And he who rolls a stone to cause God's people damage will have it rolled back on him. And this is what we see that has happened here with Daniel. Daniel continued his life, even though there was this threat, not of fines, not of imprisonment, but of being put to death in the lion's den. Now, I don't know who you identify yourself with in this story of Daniel. Perhaps you identify yourself with Daniel. You're the servant of the Lord. You're the Christian praying. Or perhaps you identify yourself with the people that created the situation for Daniel. I hope not. And we have to be very careful because Satan will try to use people, influence of other people, to draw us into doing evil. So be careful not to join a group in doing evil. And Good people have been led to do evil because of friendship and evil influences. Be faithful to the Lord at all times. Even though the crowd wants to do evil, be faithful to the Lord at all times. Now, perhaps you identify yourself with Daniel. Praise the Lord. I hope you don't identify yourself with the lions waiting to destroy God's people. But let's look at this story in Daniel chapter 6. Now we continue in verse 24, Daniel 6, 24. And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them. 
and broke other bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. So they, these lions were really hungry. It wasn't that they did not eat Daniel because they were full. They were starving, just as it was described before. Even before they hit the ground, the lions jumped upon them and destroyed them. Now, verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. You know, many of Paul's letters sound like this. Peace be multiplied to you. It's interesting. This king is writing this way. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Amen to that. Yeah. How many of you want to be part of that kingdom? God's kingdom that will never be destroyed. I hope you do. Yeah. And his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. Anybody been delivered by the Lord here? Yeah. Rescued? Praise the Lord. And he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Does he do that today? Absolutely. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Yeah. So we see that the Lord blessed Daniel. And I want to highlight something interesting here because this king wrote a decree. And as you heard, to all languages and nations, people, all dominions, the Persian Empire... Uh, at its height during Darius the Great, stretched from Europe's Balkan Peninsula in parts of what is present-day Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, to the Indus River Valley in northwest India and south to Egypt. The Persians were the first people to establish, establish regular routes of communication between three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and they built many new roads and developed the world's first postal service. Interesting, because this is another time, you remember that Nebuchadnezzar did something similar and wrote a decree to all nations. What the devil was trying to use to defeat God's purposes through Daniel, God took this and brought glory to himself. And the name of God was spread out through all the dominion and nations that the Persians had conquered. Praise the Lord. And the Lord takes advantages of opportunity. And he would like for his people who take advantages of opportunities. So you might want to consider asking yourself during this week, did the Lord provide an opportunity to make his name known, to glorify his name in some way, in some situation. Something happened at school, something happened at work, in the neighborhood that was a little opening for you yeah. to let your light so shine before men yeah. that they might glorify God. I hope you took advantage of that opportunity. And if you didn't, perhaps you may want to take advantage of today to surrender your heart completely to the Lord so that when opportunities are given to you, you will let your light right. so shine before men that they will give glory to God. You know, this story of Daniel is here because it shows us what we should do when trouble comes. Yeah. What did Daniel do? Yeah. He prayed. He prayed. Right. Daniel was faithful to God in the face of danger. So when the trouble came, question, was Daniel prepared to face it? Yeah. He was prepared to face it because he had prepared before. And I would like for you to look at, the, at a moment when Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Yeah. And while he was at Gethsemane, he told the disciples, stay here a while, I'm 
going over there to pray. And when he came back, he found them sleeping. They did not take advantage of the opportunity. And they did not do like they were supposed to do when the trouble came. So when Jesus comes, he said again, are you sleeping? Peter, are you sleeping? Peter that had made such great boasts, Lord, even I will follow you even to death. May what comes out of our lips be truly what's in our hearts. Amen. Yes. For good. That is for good. Amen. That's right. Now, Jesus says, pray lest you enter into temptation. Brothers and sisters, yeah. now is the time for us to be in prayer and connecting with God yeah. because some of us here, may face some terrible situations, right. some things that will try our faith, that unless we connect with God, we're going to have serious, serious trouble. Either we're going to fall into sin, or we're going to fall apart. All right. Or we will face that situation looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So looking at Daniel, we have to see what lesson is there for me. You know, all these things in the Bible, wonderful stories as they may be, have something for us. God is trying to speak to us through this story of Daniel and the lion's dance. So what is it that you can take from here? What is it that God is trying to tell you here? For me, once again... It brought out the importance of being connected to God, yeah. being in prayer, because trouble will come. Oh boy. Yeah. Question, has anybody received some kind of email, letter, or note, or some angel visited uh, you and said, you have been given a free pass this year. No trouble will befall you. No time of trouble will come upon you. You're going to coast through 2020 in complete peace. Anybody? Well, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Well, it is time to take advantage of the opportunity yeah. to connect with the Lord because trouble will come. Yes. Because the devil is still as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he is seeking to devour God's people. He is trying to uh, massage people to fall asleep spiritually because he knows if God's people are sleeping spiritually, he has them where he wants them. That's right, yeah. And God is calling upon us to be faithful till the end. Yeah. I'd like to read this to you from Review and Herald, October 25, 1881. There is no time to sleep now, no time to indulge in useless regrets. He who ventures to slumber now will miss precious opportunities of doing good. We are granted the blessed privilege of gathering sheaves in the great harvest, and every soul saved will be an additional star in the, crowns of Jesus, in the crown of Jesus, our adorable Redeemer who is eager to lay off the armor when, by pushing the battle a little longer, he will achieve a new, new victories and gather new trophies for eternity. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, God is calling upon us to see the example in Daniel and be faithful, pray, study the Scriptures so that you may be prepared so when the time of conflict comes, you will give glory to Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny, Pastor Ryan, Pastor John, and Pastor Kenny. When I think of Daniel chapter 6, I think of the faithfulness of Daniel and the faithfulness of his God. Daniel was faithful in his work, in his prayer life to his God. Daniel's God showed up, delivered his servant, and vindicated his name. And Daniel's God is our God too. Want to give each one of you a moment to share something about your day or the week? Pastor Kenny.
You know, what, what came very paramount to me is God calls some as, you know, to live for him as a witness you know, for such a time as that we're living in. He calls others that might have to give their life as a witness for him. But either way, as we look at the, you know, at, at the scenario that's out there, that God still rules in the universe, regardless of what we think is happening in the world or what may happen, God still sits on the throne. He's still ruling day by day. He's still watching over you and watching over me. And do we love him enough that we might be willing to risk, you know, risk our life and our jobs or whatever it might be, that we might be faithful as Daniel was faithful? That's right. Proverbs 16, verse 7, the Bible says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's the overall theme I find in Daniel's life. But even more profound than that, something came to me as I was sitting here that I believe the Lord gave to me. You know, early in Daniel's life, he decided not to eat what was on the king's menu. And the lions decided not to eat what was on the king's menu. <laughs> I'm almost tempted to just say what he said and pass the line. <laughs> that was genius. I like that. <laughs> Man, we learned last night that, you know, each and every one of us are capable of going full beast mode, right? And we see that Daniel was faced with the trial of beasts in this particular chapter. Uh, but, you know, I hope that we choose to become the right beast in these last days. Because in the Bible, there's two different lions. There's one that's seeking whom he may devour, a roaring lion walking about this earth to and fro. But I don't know about you, I want to become just like the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? Amen. Just like Jesus Christ, my Savior. And that's my prayer for myself, and that's my prayer for you people. Amen. 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 Don't make me laugh now. <laughs> uh, brothers and sisters, that song, Dare to be a Daniel, has some good words in it. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare, dare to stand, to have a purpose firm, and dare to... Make it. Make it known. Um, there is trouble coming, yes. and we need to surrender our lives to the Lord that we may have Jesus in our hearts. Yes. Let's do that. Amen. I want to encourage you at home, if you are going through a Daniel chapter 6 experience in your own heart and in your own life, know that the Lord Jesus will show up and deliver you. Yeah. Don't go away. In 15 minutes, we will come on live with our divine worship hour here from the Campus Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our special speaker is Dr. Ben Carson, and we're looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in and through him. May God bless and keep you. Mm -hmm.